I welcome you to this session of Workplace Impacts of Caregiving uh, for the Idaho Family Caregiver Conference. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to be with you today to share this content. I'm going to introduce myself and ask my co-presenter co to introduce himself, and then we'll jump right in. Uh, my name is Dara Ray, and I am here today as the founder of My Care Companions, um, a, a consulting uh, organization where we work with families to help them navigate the business and life impacts of care as they begin to help um, family members manage their own households, manage their um, business, the business of life. Um, I do have, as Mary alluded to earlier, a software product that we've developed to help with that um, called My Data Diary. But I'm also here, and, and to be transparent, um, I do My Care Companions, My Data Diary, and I founded LEARN that Mary uh, alluded to, a network of professionals um, working together to provide free quality education to the community on aging and caregiving topics. It's my greatest joy to lead that organization. But in full transparency, those things fill my soul they don't yet fill my bank account. And I stand before you also as an employee of HP. And so I uh, have the honor and privilege, I got the email this morning, today is my 15 year service anniversary at HP, uh, been with that great organization and have an opportunity to share with you where my worlds have collided as I have really understood um, the information that I've had to navigate and take in as a employee, professional, caregiver, mother, daughter, sister, friend, uh, goddaughter, helper, person, and the way that I'm seeing those uh, things happening and impacting caregiving, family caregivers who are working, and the employer, employer what's happening in the employer space. So it's my pleasure to be here today um, to introduce and share some ideas with you and begin a conversation. And I would like to now ask my co-presenter, Darren Lindvig, to introduce himself. Hi there, everyone. So I'm, I'm Darren Lindig. I am a uh, I am a caregiver of uh, of my daughter who's 26, lifelong caregiver. She has a genetic um, uh, syndrome, and we just ad identified it about two years ago, which with a specific gene um, that it, that it is. It, it typically falls around Rett syndrome in in her in her um, diagnosis but um, lifelong caregiver we are we are uh, supporting her primarily we she has she has supported living paid supported living staff but we are her primary um, family caregiver um, so I am, I am as it says on the on the screen I'm a material scientist I work at HP and I've been there 28 years. Um, so if I talk a little bit engineering wise, you know, that's, that's just my role and that's my personality. But uh, I am also part of, or I am chair of the Global Disabilities BIN, Business Impact Network as we call it within HP, but it's, it's very similar to uh, an employee resource group that a lot of other companies have. Um, and that is really how how employees are able to um, create a belonging, inclusive environment. And, and we'll, I'll talk about that more uh, later in the presentation. But I want to emphasize both. We want to share throughout this, you know, what what HP does for benefits, but also what the ability for employees to to offer and change their workplace. Um, and, and what we do um, from an HP perspective, but also recognizing we're a big company, but there are also a, a lot of other companies from one person companies to, to big companies. And hopefully we can span um, some of that, that uh, caregiving um, perspective. All right, so welcome to our session and we're gonna jump right in. Uh, let's see here if I can put it. So this is a quote I'm sure all of us are very familiar with, um, but I want to look at it through the lens of caregiving and, uh, and the workforce. And so when you think about anyone who's sitting around a conference room table on a Zoom webinar with you during the day, 
remember, they, there are still only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And all four of them are probably represented in that meeting room, wherever you are in your professional space. So we're gonna to try to make this interactive. Bear with me, we're on new technology here, but I am going to launch a poll if I'm lucky. And I'm going to ask you to identify yourself um, with as one of these um, status options. So we know who we're talking to today. Um, we only get one option here. So you have to pick the one that best describes your current status. Okay, I launched it. Can you see it? Okay. caregivers with a full-time job. Um, about 30% have a part family caregivers with a part-time job. Uh, we've got a couple of professional caregivers and somebody who is in a different category. So thank you for telling us who's with us here today. Oh, I can share those results. Look at that. There you go. Okay. Everyone can see that. See that? Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, no, stop, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, why does caregiving matter to employers? And, and I wanna start with a huge thanks to Idaho Caregiver Alliance for making this part of the platform, for making this part of today's session, for making it part of their dialogue. Um, there's a section on their website, they're focused on this, on advocating and helping us make sure this is important. Why is it important? Well, because it really is something that most people will engage in at some point in their lives. I'm sorry, I'm having to admit people, I'm a little distracted here. I'll, I'll try um, to. So their working lives. It touches people from every demographic, every level of seniority, and it ranges from childcare to elder care. Okay, hold on, I'm admitting, I'm admitting. <laughs> This is really, this is really a distraction. I'll try to admit, you just keep going, okay? okay thank you, Darren, I appreciate it. Phew, I'm glad you can take care of the admittance. Um, and caregiving has an economic and emotional toll on employees and employers. And we're gonna talk about both of those things today. All right, we're gonna launch another poll here. And, and this is, we're gonna do a little game show thing. So you're gonna need to get, give your best guess of what percentage of family caregivers are employed. So I'm gonna launch that and start our little jiggy music. Actually, here's how you all answered. And the answer is actually 60% are employed um, on average. So if you got 60%, uh, you, you get uh, kudos from me. I have no prizes, just great gratitude for your participation. Of those employed caregivers, 69% of them are reporting having to rearrange their work schedule, decrease their hours, or take unpaid leave of some kind to meet their caregiving responsibilities. So definitely an impact on um, how they, oh, there we go, sorry. There's your results so everybody can see what it is. Definitely an impact on their work and how focused they can be in their work. And when we talk about those employed caregivers, actually 56% of them work full time. So these employed work caregivers are likely working because they need to work. They need the income from the work. They need the benefits from the work. And they're having to find a way to balance full-time work. Or as you can see here, even if they're not working full-time, the average is 35 hours a week. 
it's a lot of time to be out of the house when you have major caregiving responsibilities to attend to as well. I know, preach into the choir. All right. So now we're going to go. It's important to preach to the choir sometimes. <laughs> it, is. it is. And remind you all that you're not alone. Okay. I'm now going to flip this question on its head and say, of everyone in the workforce, what percent of the workforce are caregivers? So let me launch that one. Little jiggy music. Actually, it was a bit of a trick question. The, according to the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Survey, this is dated. It's hard to find really good data, and I like to use data. It's 17%. But I didn't want to put 17% in there because that was going to be like, you know, a giveaway, dead giveaway. Um, but really, it's one in six are caregivers. So in any meeting that you're in, and you look around that table or that Zoom room, one in every six people are carrying a caregiving responsibility that you may or may not know about. Um, so, you know, you go back to our caregivers will be caregivers, 17% or one in six are. All right, so I'm gonna keep going here. And we have a growing challenge because those caregivers today that we're talking about around the table today, maybe around the table tomorrow, from child care to elder care, we have a real challenge that is we are going to be facing in the elder care space because the elder caregiver support ratio is declining. The caregiver support ratio is declined as the number of, defined as the number of potential caregivers aged 45 to 64 who are available to support each person aged 80 and older. Okay, so that's what that definition is. In 2010, there were seven to one. So there were seven people aged 45 to 64 to take care of people aged 80 and older. In 2030, it'll be four to one. And in 2050, it'll be three to one. Okay, 45 to 64 year olds are working. And now they're going to be more than doubling in the next 40 years from 2010 to 2050, the burden, the caregiving burden for aging not considering the rest of caregiving they're doing for children, for disabled loved ones, whatever the case may be. And those caregiver needs are increasing. These people are living longer and they're living longer, longer with more chronic illness and disability, more needs for support. And as we all know, with caregiver shortages and funding challenges, caregiving responsibility is falling more and more to family members, not always having available supports outside of the family. So this is truly a growing challenge for our entire community and for employers, because they're going to need to understand this shift in their workforce. So I'm going to now uh, hand, that ends the uh, pop quiz section, uh, almost. I might come back with another one, but uh, th that's the framing. That's what we're talking about. That's why we're here today, where we are, it's real, it's growing. And now I'm gonna actually have Darren walk us through what are the impacts on the caregiver in the workplace? And Darren, if you just tell me to click, I will go right ahead. Yeah, so why don't you get going? So yeah, you know, most of you are working and are caregivers, so you can relate to a lot of these, I'm sure. Uh, absenteeism, you know, there's a, there's a stat that working caregivers miss an average of six, six work days per year um you know and that's that's a you can imagine how you need to run an appointment or or there's an emergency taking place um presenteeism so that is you know a person is, is really physically at work or they're at work but they're not really productive or they're not really working and um you know that that can be that can be where there's stress in your on your mind um you've got to manage calls that are coming in or or um, taking care of business while you're at work so 
again, 24% of caregivers feel that, that caregiving has, has a real impact on their performance at work and work hours. Illness. So caregivers are two times more likely to develop chronic illnesses. Stress and anxiety. Obviously, you're, you know, a caregiver, I mean, you can think of it as I've got two jobs, you know, so you can imagine there's a little bit more stress. Um, caregivers are 2x more likely to suffer from depression. And then financial security. Um, you know, a lot, almost half caregivers experience financial strain. 25% of caregivers indicate that caregiving impacts their retirement plans. 39% caregivers leave their jobs um, uh, to have, have more time with the loved one. And, th and there's some other, other parts of this that are opportunities missed in the workplace. Um, I know for, uh, I, there's a, there was a, a statistic that uh, was, was polled from working women that are caregivers and 33% of, of, of working women caregivers decrease their work hours. 29% passed up a job promotion, training, or assignments. And another 20% just switched from full-time to part-time because of the caregiving situation. So you can see how that influences finances and, and, um, and as, as, as a caregiver um, can, can lower that opportunity space. And when you think about it from what is the economic impact of that opportunity, uh, according to the MetLife study of working caregivers and employer health costs, 10 million caregivers aged 50 plus who care for their parents lose an estimated $3 trillion in wages, pensions, retirement funds, and benefits. So this is impacting their ability to work, their ability to take care of their family financially now, as well as their own retirement and their ability to fund uh, their own future. So when you think about it from the business perspective, the categories are pretty similar, but let's look at it through the lens of the employer. So from an absenteeism perspective, 52% of caregivers have missed work or were late due to caregiving. From a productivity perspective, one in five caregivers report a decrease in productivity because of caregiving. And you could look at this and say, well, then I won't hire caregivers. Well, that's not reasonable. We just looked at the caregiver support ratio. Almost everyone in the workforce is going to be a caregiver. So businesses have to think about how they're going to manage this, how they're going to support this, not how they're going to avoid this. This is not going to be avoidable. Illness. 75% have called in sick or needed to take paid time off because of caregiving. But the, where it's gonna make the most sense to employers without even question is it results in an 8% higher medical cost to employers because of the increased illness for caregivers, the increased stress and anxiety for caregivers. It has real costs if they're not helping to support those caregivers. Caregivers are three times more likely to end up taking short-term disability after taking a family medical leave to assist another family member. And this one I think is exceptionally important uh, when we start talking about the impacts on that workforce and the, and the lost opportunity where Darren was talking about these qualified professionals are passing up opportunities. They're not taking the, the position, the promotion. From a recruitment perspective, 89% of um, polled uh, participants in this study from the National Business Group on Health say that employers' paid family leave policies are important when considering an employment opportunity. And the number for the millennial generation is like 96%, right? So as there's an expectation of younger employees that they are looking for companies that are going to support them in their caregiving responsibilities even more than employees today do. And when you do have these employees leaving the workforce, not taking uh, advantage of those opportunities, losing that institutional memory of these wonderful employees who cannot, cannot balance both, 
there's huge cost to an organization to recruit and train replacements for the 39% of caregivers who do leave the workforce to care for a loved one. So looking at this through both lenses, huge impacts to employees and employers and a call for all of us to begin to think about how do we better support caregivers in the, work, in the workplace. Um, the annual cost at lost productivity from caregiver absenteeism is more than $25 billion. So, it, I mean, it has real economic and productivity costs in the workplace. So what I'm gonna share with you now is kind of what's happening, right? There is a little bit of an awakening. We're having this conversation. It's a topic at a conference. I'll take that, right? And we're starting to see more and more studies and companies are beginning to think about caregiving, not just as, oh yeah, we have a benefit program that helps with that, but how do you develop a suite of benefit programs and make sure you have comprehensive benefit programs that really are designed intentionally to think about and support caregivers in the workplace. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we might think about those offerings. And you, know, you might've thought the Olympics were over, but we have one more event um, and we're gonna give a bronze, silver and gold level medal for companies that are um, thinking about benefits for caregivers. So for those companies that are thinking, okay, I need to make sure I have the minimal offering to really support a caregiver. It's really paid sick days for you to be able to take, not just for yourself, but if one of a person you care for is sick as well. So actually extending that paid sick leave to people you care for. Um, resource listings, very focused on caregiving responsibilities and having an employer location and employer resource to do that. Support groups inside of the business to really help people begin to connect with, with each other and become resources and supports for themselves. And stress reduction programs, which may or may not be focused specifically for caregiving, but definitely can help caregivers with stress and anxiety. So that those companies that are offering those kinds of programs, I say they get a bronze medal. To get a silver medal, you offer kind of all the bronze level programs, but you also are, are offering an EAP program with a specific caregiver resource focus. So not just a general EAP program, but some specific caregiver services offerings inside of that. Um, you when somebody goes out on FMLA, you actually offer them administrative support to navigate the application forms, um, making sure that they get that benefit and can take advantage of that benefit. Paid family leave programs fit in that kind of silver medal category. Um, coaching and care planning, um, or access to and referrals to coaching and care planning. Um, we're seeing those programs begin to emerge. The Caregiver Navigator program offered by the Caregiver Alliance is, is another example, but there are programs emerging through employers uh, that do that work as well. And then also offering some kinds of digital tools uh, for caregiver and caregiving management, perhaps maybe like Mary's new tool, um, helping people identify the work that they're doing and organize the work that they're doing. So if you're offering kind of that expanded list of caregiver offerings, I say you get a silver medal. The gold medal level is doing bronze level, sil silver level, and providing flexible work schedules and flex time, providing a caregiving platform where you can engage with resources and support, access to legal and financial counseling, a health navigator program to help you find providers for whatever your particular effort may, you know, need may be for yourself or someone that you love and care for, uh, some kind of subsidized backup care program, and employee advocacy groups that really bring to light the needs for caregiving inside of the organization for various types of um, populations, for the com community of employees, families, etc. cetera. Um, importantly, some of these are subsidized, some of these are free, and some of these are fee-based, but the fact that employers are building these into their benefit packages and showing them as kind of a caregiving support opportunities available to their employees and helping their employees find them um, and supporting them 
um, either for free or subsidized is where I believe we're starting to see an emergence of caregiving benefits in the workplace and where I expect to see growth and additional support. And we are really fortunate here in Boise, we actually have a couple of, I'm gonna call them gold medalist companies that I'm aware of, um, and I'm gonna name two. There are probably more, and I'd love to hear about them if you're aware of who they are. But we have HealthWise, which is a small nonprofit company headquartered here in Boise, about 250 or 300 employees, so small and nonprofit. And they work really hard to provide that kind of flex time, paid sick leave, legal and financial counseling in a package for their employees. Um, they were hoping to be with us today, but weren't able to join us uh, because of another conflict. But HP is a big global, multi, you know, global, huge company. And I am proud to say both as a caregiver advocate, employee at HP, I'm gonna give HP a gold medal because everything that you see on this list while not yet robust and perfect, HP is working hard to develop and deliver all of these types of programs to their employees. Um, we still have work to do, but there are some gold medal companies really embracing the future needs of caregiving. So now I'm gonna turn this over to Darren to talk about what, to, what does that really look like and what kinds of programs um, are offered. And this is um, offerings at HP today. Yeah, thanks, Tara. So, so just sharing some of the related uh, benefits that are provided to HP. I mean, remember, this is, this is, these are, these are most all third party benefits that are supported towards um, caregiving or, or related activities. Um, Grand Rounds is a health navigation system. You have a, a personal care team that you're assigned that you can that you can work through wealthy is is probably the 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 best and targeted caregiver support benefit and basically it's it's um you are you are you are assigned an advisor a caregiver advisor then and they can help um, navigate the system advocate for you um, um give you give you resources and and they're specific to caregiving so um i haven't used them but you know you can imagine as you enter into a caregiving situation that you haven't been in it might be a great starting place for for an employee uh legal advice there is a legal insurance plan i've personally used that before it is really beneficial you can get through living wills um and a lot of a lot of uh, things that you may see coming uh, that you can really, um, it makes an, an, an affordable choice. Uh, really specialized, it, it probably doesn't fall into that plan, but for some of the real um, common basic stuff, it's, it's great. Bright Horizons is, is backup childcare and elder care and um, might work for some people. You know, it depends on the situation, but uh, if you have a Bright Horizons um, location near 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 you, it might be a great choice for for people. Rethink is is specific to behavioral um, behavioral uh, resources. Um, you can think of um, your children. Um, it's 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 kind of a, a starting point, a resource, um, some 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 counseling, and um, support. Um, you can think around autism or other other learning social uh, uh, situations within your family. Um, talking talent, a caregiving, coaching um, resources for 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 goals and 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 how to, how to manage that. And then there's, a, there, there's another benefit that's specific to um, supporting veterans and, and it is targeted towards veterans, but is, is a similar, um, more all encompassing uh, support system that uh, you can tap into. So a lot of, a lot of potential benefits that, that are provided to HP employees in, in, this, in this space. 
And, and as Darren said, these um, are offered through third parties, right? These are third party companies that HP contracts with to offer. So the company doesn't offer it themselves. It's contracted and built into the overall benefit program. Okay, so now that we've given you an overview of what a gold medalist company might provide, uh, we've got a lot of working caregivers in this class. We're gonna launch another poll here. And this one, you get to select multiple options. So we would like you to check mark all of the benefit programs that you currently have access to through your employer. And side note, we will share these results, right? I, I wanna make sure that the Caregiver Alliance has access to the results of our polls so that they can share that as part of their advocacy efforts as well. So I'm gonna launch this poll and turn on some jiggy music. It's a, oh, we're not hearing you, Dara. Can you hear me? Oh, I lost you for a second. Yeah. It's a longer question. I need to give a little yeah. bit more time. I'm going to leave it for more time so that we can, maybe for this afternoon, I'll swap out a longer song. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, we've got nine respondents out of 17, 10. I'm going to let it go a little bit longer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So you can see that of all of these, you know, there's several that aren't available at all. Um, a few companies providing paid family leave, um, online in, in, or in-person coaching for caregivers and support for caregivers is kind of in that, you know, really emerging. And we're starting to see, you know, paid sick days when we're when caring for relatives becoming more mainstream, stress reduction programs becoming more mainstream, um, and FMLA. Um, and usually FMLA uh, simply has uh, to do with the size of your company. So that's a, a legal requirement. Um, but we can see this landscape and what we would consider to be a gold medal response. And um, there aren't very many companies that are yet there, um, but I'm proud to see that there are many more companies looking at this and thinking about what they need to do. And it's up to all of us to help them understand just how important it is for us as professionals, if we're professionals, as caregivers, and as employees. So I'm going to move on here. Oops, did I go? Okay, here we go, Darren. We're going to let you talk about the Business Impact Network and how it benefits HP. Yeah, so a little bit of shift from company provided benefits to, you know, what employees can do for themselves as, as a collective, um, a group of employees and how to, how to make your workplace a better place. Um, any questions that we've done so far, I, I, maybe we sh I should ask since we're switching gears. Um, I did see a question for uh, a couple of people interested in the slides. I'm putting my email address in the chat. And if you just shoot me an email address, I'll be happy to share them with you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, basically employee resource groups or business impact networks is what HP calls them. So I'll be referring to to them as bins. Um, but these are, these are volunteer employees, employees that are volunteering their time in different areas. Um, and we have them organized into six categories. They're all um, underrepresented, underrepresented groups. And like I said, I am, I'm chair of the Global Disabilities BIN Network, and there are 
others that we have multicultural. We have pride, veterans, women's, and the young employee, which is really next gen, is is their is their is their new title. But we um, all of these groups, and you can see the descriptions. It has allies under each of those. So each of these groups are available for all employees to to belong and. Uh, you don't have to have the label of having, for instance, a disability to to have to be a part of this disability um, bin. It is it is it is a it is goal to to bring a culture of belonging and inclusion throughout HP, and you can't just do that with with the segmented groups. So we are really encouraging a change in behavior and attitude around within all our employees to have a more inclusive and belonging space. Um, as part of this network, um, as, as Dara mentioned, we're a global company. We've got 55,000 employees worldwide. Um, half of the employees are, are in the United States and half outside the United States. In, in, the, in the bins, we've, we've, most of them are, are organized around different sites, like Boise has all six bins and other, other sites, um, large, larger sites similar. Some just have a couple. There are actually um, those that are small enough or remote enough or are more on a virtual bin network that may be called a diversity bin, which includes all six, all six uh, categories. There are 128, I think there's 128, 120 plus bins across our, our global network. And um, and I think that we're in, we have bins in, in 37 countries and over 20,000 employees that are part of these, these networks. So pretty, pretty good, um, pretty good representation um, and people that are involved in, in these, in these, in these networks. Okay. So focusing a little bit on why on disability and you know disability and caregiving usually go hand in hand. If if you're caregiving, typically, you're, if you're doing uh, family caregiving, you're, you're 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 caring for someone with a disability or with, it can be classified as a dis, as having a disability. But why do we even exist as a as a bin employee resource group? Um, uh, and and really, what we the reasons are you know we we are that employee voice and, and that engagement point for, for employees to participate and um, share and, and give their voice to um, whoever it may be um, within, in, within, our, within our company structure to make change or um, improve things. Bias, there's a lot of bias that, that can exist with disabilities, an example, 80% um, of, of individuals with autism are, 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 are unemployed or underemployed. Um, and so why is that? And we've, we focused uh, within our disability band as, as to, okay, we've, we know that there are individuals that have college degrees and have trouble getting hired. They, they get a degree They've, you know, they're, they've done the work, they're smart, yet they, they have trouble getting employed. And why is that? A lot of times the, the traditional interview process is, screens them out, for instance. We look at ways to um, change that process. You know, we don't want to hire someone who is just the best interviewer. We want to hire someone that can be the best for the job. So. We've, we've set up a Spectrum Success pro Autism Hiring Program that we've piloted out of Boise and are rolling that nationwide. Um, stigma, stigma is another thing. Um, disclosure of a disability within a, within a company can be um, the perception, the negative perceptions that can happen are, are real and, and, and many in cases, um, especially those obviously with hidden disabilities. And, you know, we want to change that behavior. You know, you want to bring your whole self to work. 
that kind of thing. Um, a lot of people will go to their grave to, to protect the disability because they believe it could really impact their career. And then inequity, another part, you know, as we have products and support uh, um, our customers, we wanna create an accessible and inclusive experience for everyone. So how accessible is our, our products um, and, and services? And uh, I'll, I'll put a reminder on, on myself here that, uh, you know, we encourage um, tools for accessibility. And one thing that we try to do is encourage um, inclusive communication. And one of the tools we have on Zoom is, is live auto transcription, which uh, I just had turned on there. And you have control of that under your CC button. You can hide the subtitles if you don't wanna see those. Okay. So, you know, what do we do as, as employees um, advocating and making change within our company? Um, here's the areas that we, that we are, we're impacting currently. Um, employment hiring. Um, so, so I should say that, you know, we are, we are there to support our employees and create belonging, improve employee productivity with, with our, our employees with disabilities. So, you know, are we, are we, are we, ha do we have a welcoming environment for those with disabilities? Do we have, do we have support accommodations, assistive technology? Are we able to, um, uh, to, to give them as 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 much productivity as 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 able. Do we have physical site accessibility, digital accessibility, and are we a resource for um, for understanding and and knowledge and sharing? You know, with with the variety of of disability. Um, situations out there, you know, no one's an expert on all of that. So we had to try to share that and, and, and be open with that kind of information. We, we connect globally, locally, nationally with our disability communities and, and do volunteer stuff. We uh, try to connect and, and, um, and support our local um, beyond our, our, our company. Uh, employee family supports, you know, this is an obvious example of caregiving, which we would try to promote and, and support, find gaps within our systems, within our supports, our benefits that we can, we can help. Also through education and, and as the tra traditional employee resource group, where you know somebody else that has a similar situation that you can bounce, up, bounce things off of. Supplier diversity, um, as much as we support Individuals with disabilities, we want our other we want our suppliers to do the same worldwide. And I mentioned our product services and accessibility. Uh, we often will be asked to take a look at our products and, and give feedback as to how accessible they are. Um, and then customer support, you know, it's not just touching the products, but how we treat our customers as well. And are we doing that inclusively and and and, and are, are treating with empathy their situation. And then, um, you know, really guiding our, our organization and our processes as, as how disability friendly we are as a company to our employees. Thanks, Darren, for sharing the information about how robust this type of uh, Empl volunteer employee network can be and how influential it can be for a company both supporting employees um, as disabled employees, employees as caregivers, and influencing suppliers, um, customer support, product design, um, and providing guidance to other HP, other, in this case HP, but other organizations and teams about how to do this better. Um, definitely a gold medal effort in my opinion um, for what is happening at HP and I, I full disclosure you all know I work there so <laughs> but I you know you know this is I'll, I'll go beyond this as far as um, again this is volunteer 
this is employees. This is not HR saying, hey, you need to do this. This is all driven by the employees. Now, kudos to our, our leadership team that empowers the employees to make a difference within, the, within our space. I know some companies, you know, it's an absent thought from, for them to have uh, a diverse, inclusive work, work, workplace but they encourage us to be participants and active and engaged into our own, um, supporting our own employees. And, a, and they, the um, Spectrum Success Program that we had mentioned is, is totally driven by parents that recognize the need. This was not something that um, the CEO or HR manager said that we need to do this. This was a need that was recognized by the employees and, and change was made. So I think just because we do it at a big company, there's no reason that you can't be scaled down to the smallest of companies. And so look for opportunities in that space as you, as you work or you're talking to other, other businesses. I suggest opportunities where employees as volunteers can pilot um, programs, um, suggest new things, create resources, um, because that really is what's happening here. It's 100% employee volunteer-led, volunteer-participated uh, by a company who's supportive of volunteering, but still a volunteer program. All right, so we're going to shift gears again a little bit and ask you to put into chat of all the things we've talked about today from the various gold medal programs um, from paid leave all the way to these types of robust um, employee-led advocacy groups. Um, in the chat window, I would love to hear from you what would be most beneficial to you as a working family caregiver that you don't have today. <laughs> chat button um, looks like a little dialogue bubble if you haven't used that yet. Um, and paid leave is a big one. Uh, so I, I know that that's a need uh, that companies are trying to figure out how to balance and, and what they can afford for sure. So please feel free to continue to put uh, your comments in the chat as we move on. So I think there are really, when you think about caregiver support in the workplace, um, even when the resources exist, uh, you can have a gold medal program, but you need to have knowledge of all of those programs, how they work, how to access them, how to get to them. Uh, and part of that, you know, as robust as the program is for HP employees relative to other companies, there are many employees who aren't even aware of all of the things that they could access. Um, so making sure that those programs that are offered, the resources that are available are well understood and communicated and accessible is really important. The other really big challenge is time. In order to go learn about those programs, engage with those programs, um, navigate those programs, you need as an employee to take the time to do that. And as an employed caregiver, time is probably one of your most scarce resources. So even with the knowledge, you may not have the time. And so finding a way to help those employees engage and navigate because they're the ones who have the least time to, to invest. And then the third one that is really important is a safe, space to discuss it. And Darren touched on this from the perspective of employees with disability going to great lengths to make sure that their disability is not revealed so that it is not a career killer as, as uh, you know, one of the code words that we hear. But actually you need a safe space to reveal that you're a caregiver 
it's not just a disability, but caregiving itself uh, can be concerning to people to reveal to their employer for fear that their employer is going to view them as less committed, or less available uh, to do their work. So we do have one more uh, poll for you here and I'm going to launch it. And for those of you who are employed caregivers today, would love for you to share how much your employer knows about your caregiving responsibilities. Are you fully transparent? They know everything and how complex it is. They know enough that you can survive. They're, they know some, or you are being very protective and haven't shared anything. Um, that's how we'd like you to think about this. And if you would respond to this poll, I'm going to launch it now. And Ladon, I see your hand raised, so that's, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Darren, I missed your comment. You missed my comment? Yeah. LaDawn has her hand raised. Oh, good, okay, thank you. LaDawn, do you have a comment to share? Yes, um, regarding your um, statement about transparency with the employer, et cetera, there is a difference. It's like your um, bronze, silver, gold standard. There is a difference in employers who um, say the mid-level managers or the upper-level managers, they're saying the words that mean the employee is being supported, the programs are there, but honestly, one, sometimes they don't want to hear about it because they don't want to have to think about it, and two, it's almost like it is, um, like they're forced into it by policies, they really don't want to embrace it, and that's extraordinarily frustrating. I've been in that position before, not currently, but knowing that the policies are there, but knowing that it will negatively impact me, the employee, when I have that conversation with the um, employer, for example, FMLA conversations, when the doctor is literally said in writing that I, the employee, have a need and the the employer is going to have to follow through on it, but they don't really want to. That's really, really um, when the rubber hits the road and gets really difficult, I think. Very, um, to your point, it's going to range the spectrum from employers who walk the walk, yeah, right? And, and no, don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. It's very, can be very individualized by person, right? All managers are still people and they may not understand, they may not have been able to manage through their own expectations and bias and fears. Um, so a lot of this comes down to training um, to, uh, of, of managers as well and getting endorsement and education and training um, so that they feel that they uh, are both expected to and have the freedom within the company to actually support in the way that it was designed. So you can see in the poll results that um, very few of our care working caregivers have fully shared the extent of their caregiving responsibilities. This is not surprising. Um, about half have shared some and in a lot of cases, that's because you have to, right? If you're gonna have to take on additional medical appointments during the day for someone you care for, you're gonna have to reveal some of that information, but probably still protective of the full extent of your caregiving responsibilities. And we have 25% that have not shared at all um, out of protection. And broadly, only 56% um, across the board in this particular study in 2015, um, only 56% of caregivers report that their supervisor is aware of their caregiving responsibilities. And the primary reasons for that hesitation we've talked about here, you've shared some of that, LaDon, thank you. The fear of losing your job, uh, the fear of being put on the 
exist, if there is such a thing, it, it, you know, of not being as committed. Um, also believing their employer is unsympathetic, right? They just don't understand and wouldn't understand or going to be viewed as a complainer, perhaps. And I've actually seen this a little bit uh, with some of my colleagues. Um, it's not a joyful topic. And so, you know, you, you come to work and people ask how your weekend was and you don't have a lot to share that's joyful or, or exciting or that you think other people want to hear. And so it doesn't feel like a safe space to even share interpersonally some of what is happening. So we have work to do. Um, as employees, as employers, and as advocates to help make it more of a safe space for dialogue around caregiving needs and caregiving responsibilities. So we're gonna kind of wrap the core of this session with some ideas of what you can do to help as an employee, right? If you're an employer, I encourage you to go look at that, silk, that gold medal list and talk with your, your executive committee, your owners, what can you do? What more can you do? What more can you afford to do and how can it benefit your company? I encourage you, but as working caregivers, as employees in workplaces, these are things you can do beginning Monday, right? Sh create awareness, share this information. I will provide these slides, flash them up to all your managers, let them know how important this is. Advocate for those expanded benefit programs. Not all of them are hugely expensive. Some of them are expensive, but not all of them are. And sometimes it's just about creating access and they can be working with their, their benefit brokers to even bundle some of those programs and make those programs accessible and offered. Um, they might not even know they exist. So making sure that they know there are things they might be able to tap into. I'm gonna talk now a little bit about safe space. Share your own caregiving stories. When you share about your caregiving responsibilities, what you do as a caregiver, the joys and the challenges, um, it makes it a safer space for others to come forward as caregivers. And I had this exact experience with a colleague at HP, no surprise, I talk about caregiving a lot. And I talk about my responsibilities today as a caregiver for my father-in-law. And it opened a dialogue for a woman who had just moved her mother in with her and didn't feel like she had any place to share that and to ask questions. And it opened a dialogue with the team just a support resource. We became a support resource for her. And I'm now seeing other employees ask her, Karen, how's your mom doing? In a way they never would have done providing her support because she was afraid to talk about it. And it hasn't cost anybody anything. It's just made us better colleagues and, and better supports for each other. Organizing those support groups and activities um, and thinking about them you know, beyond the short-term disability or emergent situation or, or, or the one-time baby shower, some, some companies support vacation donation. If somebody's in a caregiving crisis, does your company allow you to donate vacation days to somebody else who may need to use some of those if you don't need them? Um, organizing meal trains for families in crisis, employees in crisis, um, helping those kinds of things. Maybe you have a neighborhood that does it. There's no reason an employee group of, of colleagues wouldn't be able to do that and wouldn't be very willing to do that if they just knew of the need. Uh, and really, I'm gonna say celebrating the joys of caregiving a little bit more than we think about it. And I'm going to share a, a bit of an, an introduction to that story and that, in, that concept of, not too long ago, I hosted a baby shower for a uh, colleague who was expecting her second baby and we had a wonderful celebration. I have a colleague in the caregiving industry that promotes celebrating a senior caregiving shower. And when somebody decides to take on the responsibility and the joys of caring for a loved one in their senior years, let's shower them with the same kind of 
support and goodness as they enter this caregiverhood, just like we celebrate parenthood. And let's shower that person with a temporal scanner and an oximeter and maybe some uh, uh, you know, gift cards for meal delivery or house cleaning as they navigate this new space and let them know it is a safe and loving space that we want to support them in because this is the kindest gift as Dr. Trump said. I mean, she's doing this because she loves her mother just as much as she loves her son and all of those things that were done. And then ultimately something we can do every day is practice encouragement and kindness and acknowledge the special gift that someone is giving. Tell them how much you appreciate the contribution they're making to their family, to the community, the gifts they're giving to their loved one. Um, seeing the caregiver and recognizing your colleague caregiver and making them feel seen and their contribution seen. We can all do that Monday, right? We take that into the workplace and all of these things make it a safer space and make us better advocates for caregiving supports in the workplace. So in conclusion, creating a caring culture in the workplace does require some money if you're gonna offer benefits. It requires time and it really does require leadership. So influence your leaders to think about caregiving in the workplace. If you are a leader, please think about this. Uh, consider what it's going to take to be a gold medal caregiver, caregiving support organization. Because if you do, it's an investment in the business that will benefit the employees and the organization's bottom line. And it's something we should all do because it's the right thing to do. So I think that's our presentation today. And I would love to open it for any questions you might have. Questions or comments? All right, well, I'll stay here and take questions. I'll add a little jiggy music if anybody would like some jiggy music. We've got some to, you know, let you think about. Give everybody a few more minutes. Any comments, Darren, before we end? No, I mean, I, I, I love your idea, you know, with celebration. How do you, how do you do it so that it's not a, sympathy or um you know a, a sympathy event or you know because I, I don't know if if you want it to be a a more positive event not like oh i'm so sorry here's here's some money or yeah it's, i feel so bad for you you know there are a couple of ways you can do that um and i loved all of the pictures that Dr. Trump shared this morning. And I would encourage, um, if I were to host that event, I would, first of all, make sure that the person you're hosting for is open to it. And they, you know, just like a baby shower. Some people don't want a baby shower. Some people might, might not want a senior caregiving shower. But ask them to bring pictures of their loved one and tell stories and share about this person that they now have the honor and privilege of supporting. And introducing that person and, and helping people know who it is they're taking to doctor's appointments and things like that. And be transparent with what would be most helpful. And, you know, the senior shower itself um, might just be support, right? It might just be a, a celebration of this life transition. They might not even need anything. But embracing that. Mary, I see a hand. I was going to say with having my dad in my home, because I'm living this with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, with having my dad in my home, I don't necessarily think a party would be what he would want because he is not a social person in big crowds. However, maybe a um, would you like an afternoon where we come, you know, somebody they might know has coffee. Uh, my dad loves to be taken to lunch by like one, maybe two people, but he doesn't want to be overwhelmed. So um, when my sister comes over or ha or maybe just a way to log them into different supports for 
their older relative. I know that the peer support program has been really valuable to my dad, having somebody that's outside of our home come in once a week, well, come over once a week to take him out in the community. They play um, Carcassonne every week over at the Lucky Perk. And that's something that he can get out of the house, do something different, and then come back and tell us about it so that he doesn't feel like it's just him hearing about our lives. He can have a life separate from ours as well. So I think those are all really good ideas. And it's something I hadn't thought about. The senior, the caregiving shower that I was talking about was really for you, right? What do right? you the caregiver need? But it could be a gift for the, the care recipient as well. And perhaps you could shift it if, it if what's really needed is he would love to have somebody come and have coffee with him. And, and, and I don't need a meal train. Come by and spend 15 minutes and have coffee with us some Saturday. And welcome those colleagues into your world to get to know you and the person you care for. Um, just like you would invite colleagues to see the new baby, right? Come meet my dad, come play a hand of cards with us um, and provide, maybe host an open house, right? Your colleagues host an open house for everyone to come meet your dad, tell stories, that kind of thing. There's lots of ways you can think about this, but the intent is to take this out of the shadows and instead celebrate the joys that come with family caregiving and bringing, in this case, a senior into your world again, right? And caring for a parent. Uh, let me see if it cut. <laughs> Hold it right All in right. front of the body. All right. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take my my virtual background off really quick, which you'll see. But like this is what I love about stuff with having my dad here. Yeah, exactly. And those are the pictures I would encourage sharing with your colleagues. LaDonna, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, I like um, the concept of um, doing the party from a respite standpoint, you know, pass out your gifts or your uh, caregiving respite certificates. I will come do coffee with your dad. I will take your dad to a baseball game. I will sit with your dad and play Monopoly or whatever it is that they like that so that it's a, a party for success, you know, like the future. Um, and the second thing that I would like to bring up, and I don't want to be the, you know, last person to talk and be the downer, but I follow the AARP caregiving blog on Facebook. And there is so much of the opposite of what we're talking about today, which is the love and um, satisfaction and joy that caregiving brings to our lives. That blog really, um, you know, challenges my heart. And there's so many people who feel that they have no choice and they're resentful of being caregivers. And they feel like, and I'm glad for it, that they have a safe place to vent. But it's just heartbreaking for me to have um, people doing caregiving when they don't want to do it, you know? And I, I think what I would say is I hope, and, and you can't, we can't change all of that, right? But I would hope that as, as colleagues and friends and, you know, creating that caring culture in our workplace, the support we might provide to one another would help ease that burden a bit. It's not going to take it away, but if they know they're not alone, if they know they can talk about this, so many of the people that I, I follow the blog as well, and so many people there feel isolated, feel alone, don't have a place, and are carrying the burden on their own. Mm -hmm. These types of programs, I mean, again, 60% of caregivers are working. Most of them are working full time. Their network of support are their colleagues. So creating that place in a workplace, both formally and informally with these employee led type activities, I would hope would help with some of that. It won't make it go away, Ladon. It's a reality of any um, chronic caregiving situation, right? It's not all joyful, right? And you have to look for the joy, um, but you have to have someone to share it with too. Any other comments, questions? I uh, hope you're okay with it, Dara. I put in the the 
website for the nonprofit I run that does community activities for people with disabilities. One of the things that I've done is network with a lot of local businesses to provide a safe and welcoming space in businesses for people who are either disabled or work with people with disabilities to go and enjoy activities. We go to Pojo's every third Wednesday. We there's bricks and minifigs is a great place if you like to play with Legos. Wood Creations has wonderful projects you can create cool art for your home. And those are all events that are on our on our calendar that get you out into the local businesses and connect with other people. I don't mind at all. Thank you so much for sharing. And I encourage anyone else who That's has great. something that they think would, would benefit this conversation, this group of people, please share. Any other comments, questions, ideas? Well, don't offer that. I will stop talking. <laughs> well, I, I will say thank you for joining Darren and I for today's session, for engaging in this dialogue and hopefully taking uh, some of these ideas with you to work on Monday and, uh, and helping us all change um, our workplace cultures to a culture of more caring. So have a great day.